What a wonderful opportunity to be here today. Today is the day the Lord has made, and we'll rejoice and be glad in it. Uh, this is uh, Bible session time. Our topic for today is tithe. What did we say? What did we call it? Tithe. The concept and bigger picture. Tithe. The concept and bigger picture. Now, very many times we have a whole lot of questions to ask when it comes to the subject of tithe. Tithe, offerings, first fruit, but we're just going to center on tithe today because it's such a vast topic. We don't want to just plunge into it and not be able to do justice to it. So we're just limiting it to tithe, which is a seed. So uh, let's just open it with prayer. Father, today we just want to thank you. We don't seem to be master, you know, in, in this, but we will receive from you, O God. And such as we receive, we give. So, Lord, meet and touch your people and let understanding come down today. And let us get wisdom. And because the beginning of wisdom is get, so let's get wisdom and above and on top of that, get understanding. Because man is able to move through on the level of understanding that they get in anything. So we receive understanding today, both the speakers and the hearers, for the name of the Lord to be glorified. Amen. Amen. Joining today is uh, Pastor Daniel Femi, my son, and uh, we're going to be talking about this uh, concept of tithe, tithing. So I'm just going to open it up and and and. And say you have a word, opening word to say to throw it to. Yeah, I mean this is a pretty, as you said, is a pretty vast topic. Uh, but when you think about tithe, um, there are different thoughts about it. There are different uh, theological beliefs about tithe, um, and so I think it's something important that we as Christians should get right uh, because if we can understand the principle of tithe. It can, can make a tremendous difference in our lives. Um, really, uh, the understanding the principle of uh, understanding the principle of seed time and harvest. Understanding uh, why did the concept of tithe even come up in the Bible, and what do modern day um, contemporary Christians? How are we supposed to apply this biblical principle in our lives? Um, tithe to me isn't limited to just money. There's time. There's resource. There's, there's so many different ways that you can look at the idea of tithing. Um, but I think there's some fundamental principles that we should understand as Christians if we are going to take hold of this promise that is so evident for us in Scripture. So I'm excited to reveal that secret, to reveal that promise that we can take hold of. And I believe it can make a tremendous difference. It's made a difference in my life. Um, I've seen it make a difference in the lives of other believers that I know who really believe in tithing. And so we'll just share some of those principles tonight and believe that people will be blessed by it. One thing that I want to mention right now is uh, I feel a little bit better to discuss this on this platform. If I have to teach it in our local church, it always carry that, that cringy kind of attitude. But now I'm not saying it to you so that you can put the money into my pocket, so I'd rather just say it. the way it is, it's, it's, it's been laid down. So if you get understanding and you choose to want to do it, you will be putting it into the church that you worship at. So so I'm free now, please, can I just be free to say it? Just like the word says, and not feeling that, oh, he just want to put some little penny in his pocket, which is far from me. That is just a deception. Of the enemy. So let's go to Genesis 8 and uh, I want to look at Genesis 8 verse 20. Genesis 8 verse 20. It says here, it says, Then Noah built an altar to the, and just before that, this this story was a story when the Lord decided to destroy the entire living being on the earth, and then they have the just eight people and a whole lot of different kind of animals and birds and all that. And when they sailed for 40 days and eventually the boat touched down, touched ground, and he came out. 
The whole place was in a total ruin, mess. No existence, no life was able to exist then at that time. But the first thing he did is set up an altar and he offered uh, offering to the Lord. Now this he did without any coercion. This he did willingly from his heart. This he did from a heart of appreciation. And he just went down, set, built an altar and offered sacrifice. And when the smell rose up to heaven into the north sea of God, the Bible says, as a sweet smelling savor. Now what happened? Verse 21. When the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma, he said in his heart, Never again will I curse the ground because of man. Even though every inclination of his heart is evil from his youth. And never again will I destroy all living creatures as I have done. As long as the earth endures, as long as the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter. I'm going to. I'm my Bible is my something. Okay, summer and winter. Sorry. Oh, day and night shall not cease. Day and night shall not cease. See now, he said all those things. Even the covenant of day and night will never stop going down or sun rising in the morning. It will that that is it. As long as the earth remains, seed time and harvest time. If you put the seed in, there must be harvest. That's what he said right there. He said it will never cease. But did he say harvest time and seed time? So it's not that you have the harvest today and you remember and tomorrow harvest is not so. No, the seed will provoke the harvest. And if you go back and you said that uh, in Genesis 1 and you said that uh, and the Lord created, let me see, let me see, let me see here. Genesis 1 and 28. Genesis 1, 28. Chapter 1, verse 28. Then God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. He already said that. Be fruitful and multiply. And have dominion over everything. That is, a, that is already it's a decree of God for you to be fruitful and multiply. And if somebody goes to Genesis 4.1, I'm going to build the theory. I'm going to move ahead quickly. Genesis 4.1, what, what's that saying? Now Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain and said, I have acquired a man from the Lord. Go ahead. And she bore, bore again, this time, his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. In the process of time, it came to pass that Cain bought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. And Abel bought of the firstborn of his flock and of the... And of the fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was very angry and his countenance fell. And the Lord said, so the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not well, sin lies at the door, and its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. Now, this is it. As long as the earth remains, seed time and harvest time, heat and cold, day and night will never cease. And it says that when you put the seed in, it will provoke the harvest. And if you have to wait for harvest to put your seed, when there's no harvest and you hold, withhold your seed, 
just like you are unsteady, irregular in your seed sowing, so will the unsteadiness be in your harvest season. Now, why am I saying that? He said to Cain, if you have done what Abel did, you will have received what Abel got. But he didn't do like he said. So, and he said, as long as you remain, as long as you continue to sow the seed, it will be as long as you will continue to get the harvest. But he said that, and the Lord created every tree and every herb according to what? It's kind. Because in it, there is the seed in them all to reproduce. God don't say, told me to tell you all through the New Testament, and I have two specific area where you talk about tithe in New Testament, I will tell you. Now, if you do what he says, you will get what he promised. The moment Noah offered this, they put out the offering, the Lord responded with promise. No longer will I destroy. And he said that as long as the heaven remains, as long as the earth remains, Satan will not cease. Cold time will not cease. Covenant of day and night will not cease. And then, and then when Abel did the way the Lord said, put the seed, the, 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 the what is it? The, the, the flock, the cattle, and its fat. He received. Because he that promised is faithful and is not respecter of men. And then when he did not, Cain did not do like he's supposed to do, he did not receive. But he was upset. And God said, why are you upset? Your reason for being upset is within you. If you had done like he did, wouldn't you have re been, been received? Now, if, you, if you're still looking around and wondering what, I want to go to uh, the very first mention. They call that first mention principle. And you know where that is? If we just open it up. I believe, go to Genesis 14, 14, verse 20. A lot of people say that, well, tithe is an Old Testament law. You know, no, if, you, if, you, if you're of that belief, you are wrong. Tithe is not Old Testament law. The law was later given, if you go to Leviticus and all that, you start to see the law. How come Abraham, the one that had the promise, gave the tenth of all that he got from the world to Melchizedek? And who is this Melchizedek? So, if he did that, you know, it will, and, and, and eventually it says that Abraham, when did we... Start hearing of the children of the, the Levites and, um, and the children of Aaron, right? Way, way much later. Abraham was the great grandfather of, the, of, of, of Aaron, then the Aaronic priesthood came way after Moses. That's what great grandfather did. Gaps is so, so long. It was after they came out of Egypt. That Aaron was Moses' brother. Aaron was not even in existence when they were in, 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 in when Joseph moved them all to Egypt. And Joseph was the grandchild of Abraham through Isaac, then Joseph, and the great grandchild. So Abraham gave tithe way before Aaron was ever born. Aaron became the priest by the ordination of God, and through that, is generally the tribe of Aaron, the priesthood, came to be. He gave tithe. So, the, the, the tithing priest concept predated the Aaronic priesthood. And so, it is wrong theology to say that the law already been done with. It's not the, that, that was a pre, pre, uh, concept, it predates the law. So why will God continue to give them seed after he has given them herbs and trees 
that have seed that produce after its kind. And he said, be fruitful and multiply. So I've given you seed, then you continue to reproduce. I don't need to give you another seed. As you continue to plant, put the seed of this tree, it generates the kind of fruit. You put the seed, and forever, and he said that I will multiply and replenish. Now, who... <laughs> I was listening to this wonderful preacher that I, I, one of the preachers I really respect. And they were saying something like, if your daughter should come home pregnant, how do you, a seed must, must have been sown before you see the, the, the harvest. And he said, woman, married woman should come and say, I, 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 and they're looking for fruit of the womb. And you bless her, you anoint her, you pray for her, you do the entire church fast all over her and all that. And then, will anything happen without seed first being put in? No. Okay, that, that is it. Seed provoke the harvest. And he already giving you the herb and the tree that produces after its kind because, you see, the seed is in the harvest. If the seed goes in the ground, harvest would follow. And seed do not produce one seed back. It's multiple that comes back from that one seed that goes in the ground. All right, so is, is, do we have questions? Do you want to comment? No, I'm just thinking, so if someone says, and in following the logic that you're laying down is that this was established before the law. So Abraham did this before God took the children of Israel out of Egypt and established the law. Abraham did this here where he established the concept of the tithe. He gave the tithe of all that he had received. So if someone says, okay, what if the law happened? How do we know specifically that it's applied to the New Testament? Because Jesus never mentioned anything about the tithe. That is not true, I would tell them. Jesus mentioned about the tithe and gave me the passage where they went to him and they said to him, no, no, he saw and he rebuked the Pharisees for being hypocrites. You know, Jesus, been, he, all this while he's been crushing some wrong belief. He's been, it, it's been kind of like it, 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 it remodeling the laws. When he said to them, he said, I have not come to destroy the law. I've come to perfect the law. And did he really perfect the law? Oh, yes, he did. He said, well, you guys said that thou shalt not commit adultery. Did Moses say that? He said, yeah, Moses said we should not commit adultery. I said, all right, I'll tell you this. If an adultery is like when, you, you remember the lady that was caught in the act? That was the kind of adultery that Moses was teaching. But uh, Jesus now said that, you don't need to see the physical thing being happening right there. But if you should look lustfully at a woman in a way to undress her, you've already committed adultery. He took it to the next level. And he said that, you know, the Bible said that shall not commit murder. But if you think, if you have a deep, bad motive, a recurrent intention against your brother, you've already committed. So, so what was Jesus saying? He was bringing it to a standard and destroying the, 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 the deception and the impossibility that was in the law. Yes, what is it? Uh, Matthew 23, 23. Okay, hold up. Read it out for me, please. Matthew 23, 23. What sorrow awaits you, teachers of religious law and you Pharisees? It's coming against the law now and it's trying to set it at a higher level. Hypocrites. Hypocrites. For you are careful to tithe even the tiniest income from your head. Did you mention tithe there? He said you do tithe to the very little pin. You will, you will, you will measure the comic to the very little tent so that you don't give a, a, a dot over or below. Your, your gardens, but you ignore the more important aspect of the law. It said that now you do this tie to the last, but what the weightier thing, somebody, the other person said, you've neglected the weightier thing, which is compassion, righteousness, justice. Justice, mercy, and faith. You're right. You should tie it, yes, but do not neglect the more important thing. He said you should tie it. Was that Jesus? Was that written in red? Yes. Was that in Matthew? Yes. So Jesus said, you see, he's saying that now, Nothing is wrong with tithing, 
But even as you guys put too much emphasis on tithe and you neglect the suffering people, this you should do without neglecting the tithe. And another occasion that looks close to it, they brought him to the coin and said, that, should we pay tithes to Caesar? He said, what image is on this? He said, Caesar. He said, well, read down to Caesar. What is Caesar? And unto God, what is God? Yeah. Should we pay taxes to Caesar? Render off to Caesar, what is Caesar? You know, it's interesting because that's a very good point. And when I was thinking about this, I thought about the fact that I think as Christians, we need to get to the point where we no longer, um, what's the word? We no longer have to cajole people. Yeah. You know, and I think when it's a heart thing, this tithing thing, and I think when you understand the concept of tithe, it, it, it really shows you that it's not about God just putting something that he wants us to do. It, it, it's deeper than that. Because if you look at Malachi 3.10, it says, bring all the tithe into the storehouse, right? That there may be food in my house. And he says, try me now in this. God says, in another verse, it says, test me. God tells us, test him. If you don't believe in the concept of the tithe, try it out. I've seen situations where um, they, uh, in, a, in a previous ministry that I know we were in before, they said, they had people who didn't believe in tithe and say, try it for six months and see the difference. And I believe that's a powerful thing because when you look at it and you say, okay, I've never tithed before, and you see your financial situation. If you're satisfied with where you are financially, fine. But if you believe that God has more, God is telling you in this scripture, says, try me, test me, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour out such a blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. Hardly do you see in scripture where God himself is telling you to test him in this, try him in this. And so to me, that settles the matter in, in so many respects is that not only did we point to a fact where Jesus says it, but in the scripture it says, try me, test me in this. And so for us as Christians, it, it's all about the revelation. What revelation of God do you have? If you get blessed and God opens up a door and you make wealth, and if you don't see it as a heart thing that, you know what, a portion of my income that I make, whether from business or whether from, you know, employment, a portion of my income, I should be able to bless the Lord with it. It's not that God needs your money. See, that that's the thing. It's not that he needs your money. God is looking at your heart. Where are you storing your treasures at? And if all the wealth that you're making, if the money that you're creating, you don't see it as, you know what, a portion of this, I'm going to say, thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Tithing is the barest minimum. Tithing should be the minimum. We shouldn't, as Christians, we shouldn't be arguing any longer the concept of tithing. We should get to a point where you realize that, Lord, I want to go beyond 10%. I've heard stories where tremendously wealthy people have said, Lord, I want to sow 90% of my income before. And they were in a position to do that. I believe, and I don't want to misquote it, but one of the giants... Uh, one of the major corporations, Colgate. the CEO, Colgate. was it Colgate? He um, made a dedication to God and he said, Lord, I want to tithe 90% of my income. And God blessed him in such a way he was able to do that. So he moved beyond the revelation of, oh, 10%, that's a lot. No, it, it's, it, that's the barest minimum. And the Bible is saying, test me in this if I would not do this. So I think... You know, what I love about this conversation is that it's not only talking about the fact that we should do it, but we're getting to the heart of the matter. Where's your heart? Because even if you tithe and you don't have and your heart isn't in the right place, you're not going to receive the blessing in it because there's a heart thing in it, too. So even if you say and you grudgingly give, God's not going to bless that. It's all about your heart. Where is your heart? Do you, do you rejoice? Do you say, Lord, I thank you for what you have blessed me with. I know that if it wasn't for you, I wouldn't have this. I know that you've opened up doors in my life that no one else could open. I celebrate you. I honor you. So you come with a heart that rejoices and celebrates and say, thank you, Father. Here, 
I give it to you. So that's the concept that we, when we're talking about tithing, it's not from a grudging place. It's from a place of thankfulness and gratefulness. And the minimum is 10%. You see, when Noah's Ark landed, the sense of gratitude, the attitude of gratitude and thanksgiving pushed him without being told and he launched out and he offered the offering and that provoked God's promise. Now, I yesterday we talked about, in church we talked about covenant and I, 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 I said things like understanding the covenant. I, I said things like every revelation produces to the level of our understanding of it. How much do you understand the concept of tithing? And when you understand it by revelation, you will launch in and do. He was saying not grudgingly, because when you do it grudgingly, you are, an, you are unwillingly obeying. That does it. Correct. Unwilling obedience. Now, this is for every promise in the world comes with a condition. Uh, a covenant is a spiritual platform where we commit God by our obedience to faith for God to make good his promise. We commit. Now, there is nothing you can do for God without faith. Faith is necessary. You can say without faith, no one can please the Lord. So you need to have faith and trust and believe that he that promised is faithful, and this one that promised no respecter of man. If a, it's a hidden should die, there will be blessing. If they're not, what you sow is what you're going to reap. If you sow, now I've met some members of our church, and as a couple, I, 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 asked, I asked them for an appointment, they came to me, and I said that, okay, towards the end of the year, and I said, you see, both you and your wife, I just sense that if you guys don't have problem, Tithing. I said, but you are an entrepreneur. You believe in multiple streams of income. So as you tithe, will you now start to sow into here? Evangelism, just sow into prayer, pray for the sick, and sow into resolving dispute. So as you start to do different things, remember not just talking to people to, re to, re to, re to re resolve dispute. It's not money. Because Christians always have this cringy thing about our money. I said, if you guys want to start to see multiple streams of income, you are tithers, then plug, plug your, your resources into different areas of the church so that the, the profit will be coming from, the income will be coming from different streams. Do start, get into evangelism. What's evangelism? You don't, you don't have to talk to people. I don't want to talk to strangers. Good. Can you pray? Can you get the leads from those that have gone to the field and start to call and start to roll them in? Can you clean the fish after it's been pulled out of water? And then as you are doing that, now if you are doing all these good things, praying for people, people will pray for you, trying to, to help the sick, the Lord will help you when you are sick. But if you are one that used to God's seed, that is seed that you are sowing, then it will come back to you way much more than you put in. And if you sow in discord, then it, your life will be tumbling because that's what will come back to you. It is what you sow that you will reap. And you don't reap it at the proportion that you sow. Press down. Shake it together. So when you sow trouble, trouble will come to you in a whole lot more much way. And when you sow peace, peace will come to you like a river. So if you pay your tithe, just don't limit yourself. Tithe is the least, is the least you can do. Don't sit on that. When you pay your tithe, involve in this. Involve in that. Be a good person. Reach out to this. And I keep saying that covenant is a spiritual platform. Because every word that's been said, if you pick God's principle, promises, and you do the condition that's attached to it, the promise will come. Because the promiser is always faithful. A truth of scripture that we engage with in truth and in deed, that truth that we engage in, in truth and in deed, commits God's integrity to perform. And since there is no promise of the scripture without conditions attached, when we subscribe to the condition, the promise graduates to a covenant, thus becoming binding on God to perform. So pick one part. He said, press down, shaking together. Let me just put God to test. 
And don't put in and say, okay, right now, let's to tomorrow somebody might come because I just did something. Let it become a habit. Let it become a lifestyle. You wouldn't know when it starts to yield. See? All right. So, he said it. He said, you hypocrite Pharisees, you can tie it like this, like this, but the weightier, more important thing you have neglected. You should not stop tithing, and you should this you should do without abandoning the tithe. And they said, Where is it in the New Testament? I will take you all to the book of Hebrews very soon. You have anything to say? Is there any question online? We have a question here. Yes, let's take that first. Um, yes, I, I just want to quickly get a clarification. And the clarification has to do with the Malachi part that says you are being caused if you don't pay your tithe. Which is one of the things that the argument that people are now making that there is no cost associated with you not paying your tithes. That willingly you do it, and if you don't do it, there is no cost. And that also, that tithing or not tithing is not a prerequisite for making heaven. That is a tithing is so that you can be blessed here on earth. So, if I choose not to be blessed and I decide not to tithe, that is on me. I just want us to clarify that. Is that, uh, is that correct or there is more to it than that? As a Christian, is there any part of the Bible that I take out and say it's not correct? When the Lord said to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, of all the trees, it. On this one, the day you eat, the day you die. If I say that may represent the tithe that belong to God, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which God is eventually going to reveal to them at the time, but not at that premature time. God will come and would give them wisdom and tell them, oh, what do you name this? That's giraffe. Oh, I can see the long neck. What do you name this? That's an elephant. I can see the shit. Now, he made men so that he can have continuous fellowship with men. And then when he said, this one is the Lord, don't touch it. And he said, tithe is the Lord, don't touch it. But when you go and violate the law of God, is there a consequence for the Adam and Eve? The act of the truth, but they caused. Cause be you the woman. Cause be you the man. Can you just look at it and say, he gave you all, the, okay, you have 90%, but this 10% don't touch it. And that's what they went to touch. And they were caused. Until that tree now became two and said, okay, now the, the tree of, the, 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 of knowledge of uh, uh, the life and death, they would not let them touch it. So they would live forever. So they got that. But in the beginning, it was one tree. Don't touch it. And they abandoned the ninety, and they went after the one. They said, "Don't touch." They were caused. But I'm not saying what well, I'm not going to be. Not I'm not going to be so theological about this. Did the Bible say it in Malachi? Is that part of the Bible that I was saying? No, oh, no, I'm going to take this one. This is a wrong thing. Should I put this? And then second question you are asking is that if they do not, it's not a condition for heaven. Mm -mm, you're right. Such as water baptism is not a condition for heaven. Water baptism won't take you to heaven. Salvation takes you to heaven. You believe with your heart, you confirm with your mouth, damn, that is serious. I, I, I mean to say, boom, that's it. But when you don't do the water baptism, you struggle against sin. He wants to help us to cut the sin-loving nature of man out in the water of baptism where the spiritual surgery takes place. It's not a condition for heaven, but it makes your life on earth a little bit challenging. And when you don't do what it says and you struggle, well, your life will be miserable. You won't even help. You may not. I pray to God I won't, won't end up going to beg for food. Because when you can release, and it's a test of loyalty and trust in God and love for God. For the Bible says where your heart is, where your treasure is, that's where your heart will be. Is your heart with God or is it with the spirit of mama? It's a test. Yeah, yeah um, I definitely agree. I think it's a good question to ask because I can see where someone could phrase that. Um, I can see where people could say, well, 
One, is it a condition for heaven? No, it's not a condition for heaven. We establish that. Um, I think when we look at the cursing and the blessing of it, I think the challenge with, the, with someone who raises that question is um, the assumption is we are neutral, right? The assumption with the question is that will I be cursed? The challenge is you're already cursed. You see, outside of Jesus, you're already cursed. So what happens is if you, if you say to yourself, okay, um, if I don't tithe, am I going to be cursed? So if I'm a Christian and I don't tithe, am I going to be cursed? Our finances and everything that's attached to us, right? And I, and I, and I really want to explain this clearly because it's a, it's, a, it's a very important concept that we get between being cursed and not being cursed. Um, the type of life you want to live on earth, right? So... God has provided this as a blessing, as an opportunity for us to be blessed. It's a promise that he's given us. Um, the children of Israel, when they were leaving Egypt to enter into the promised land, that was a promise. Now, not everyone attained that promise. They were children of Israel, born in the lineage, in the line of Abraham, but not everyone attained that promise. In life, there are promises that God has for us. And if we don't adopt certain principles, we won't lay hold of the promises that he has. So it's a choice that you can make, but it's, it's, it's almost like you're setting yourself up for a um, miserable life. Yeah, miserable, but it's, it's almost as if you're, you're not even going to step into the fullness of who you are, who you can be. So it's like, it's like, I think when I look at it about the question of whether or not you're cursed, Scripture does say it. It says, will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, in what way have we robbed you? And he says, in tithe and offering. You are cursed with the curse. So the Bible just doesn't say something just to say it. You, you are cursed. The question is, how is that curse going to manifest itself? I, I think that's really what people want to know. All right, if I'm cursed, the Bible says I'm cursed. Okay, what's really going to happen? And, 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 and we can't fully tell you what's going to happen. But we will tell you, we can tell you what won't happen. You won't step into the fullness of all the promises God has for you. You won't be able to take hold of everything that he has. You won't be able to, to be as wealthy as he's called you to be because of the fact that there is that piece of you being cursed. And so it's not something to take lightly and think, oh, okay, the Bible says I'm cursed. All right, it's no, like when the Bible says you're cursed with the cursed, and then he goes on to say that, you know, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Then he says, bring all the tithes into the storehouse, right? There may be food in it, and try me in this. I will open the windows of heaven and pour out such a blessing that there will not be enough room to receive it. And then he says this, I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, so that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground. I mean, it, it's, a, it's so pregnant with the promise that you won't get that. It says, I will rebuke the devourer for your sake so that he will not destroy the ground, the, I mean, the fruit of your ground, nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit for you in the field, says the Lord of hosts. I mean, it's powerful. So what the curse will manifest itself in the fact that you won't lay hold of the promises that God has for you. You won't be all that he's called you to be. And and it's it's one of those things where it's a condition that you have to recognize that do I want to be cursed? However way the curse plays out or do I want to step into all these promises that God has laid out for you? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, I'm glad we are treating that because immediately you say that, the counter that people come up with is well, here we go. That is the law. We are no longer under the law. And I'm glad we have been able to establish one thing tonight, that tithe is not a law. It's a principle. Now, that predates the, that predates the, the law. law. So here, here is where uh, I'm, I want us to be able to, you know, like really tidy everything together tonight. Is Now, the law establishes the cost. But Christ has redeemed us from the cost of the law. Now, since Christ has redeemed us from the cost of the law, the principles still stand, but the cost of the law is no longer in effect under Christ. Now, I won't say that. It now 
brings me to the fact that based on my understanding, I willingly come into paying tithes. But if I'm not doing it, it's not the cost that should not actually be the driving force for me doing it or not doing it. It is my understanding of what tithe is all about. Christ says I should pay tithe. Is uh, we've already established that the principle is there, but the driving force is not going to be the cause. And where I think we have been actually having an issue all along is because prior to now, the driving force that most has been using is that look, it's a cost. It's a cost. It's a cost. And people after a while just be like, wait a minute. The cost is the law, and Christ has redeemed us from the cost of the law. So how come we're still talking about the cost of the law when we talk about tithes? It's, we, we look at it as the consequence of lack of understanding. It affects us. Now, when the young rich ruler went to Jesus and said, I want to, well, what can I do to gain to do eternal life? And he said, you know what the law, the, what the commandments say. That shall not kill, that shall not steal. Now, do we, do we cancel the commandments that was given in time of the Lord? Or? Moses went on top of the, during the Exodus movie when we were working in the journey, he went in and brought the Ten Commandments. This is the commandment. Is that, those are laws? Don't do, thou shalt not. Have we discarded that today? No. So why do we cherry pick what we want to hear, Christians are so smart in the wisdom of the world, but we do not attack the wisdom of God. Now, when we said that the, the tithe was established, the first mentioned principle, which, which means the very first time that thing was ever mentioned, was when Abraham paid ten to Melchizedek, and tithe was there, set, established. And then he said that, I wish that you prosper and remain in good health as a soul prosper. And he said, multiply and be fruitful and replenish. That's been God's purpose. But when you follow the conditions set down, like I said, that any truth of scripture is tight part of this truth of scripture. If you follow it and you engage with in truth and in deed, you commit God's integrity to perform. Since there is no promise of the scripture without conditions attached, we, when we subscribe to the condition, the promise graduates to a covenant, thus becoming binding on God to perform. Now, when he said, go and sell all what you have, and give to the poor, and take off your clothes and follow me, he went sad. And the Bible, Jesus said, at home, how difficult. He never said, it's impossible. How difficult is it for rich man to enter him? Is it for, then they, they, they start to wonder about, about themselves. How, how, what is a tough saying? Who can make it? And he said, I say again, how difficult it is for a rich man to enter. It's even easier for the camel to go through the eye of the needle. And he said, but we have left our father and mother and follow. He said, if you have done that, if you can release that which is heavy for you, if you are not under the curse or by the spirit of mammon, which is what it is when you don't. They say, uh, it, it, it said in that way, he said, no one that has left the father, mother, brother, sister, do, 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 will definitely will have hundred percent, hundred fold here on earth. And that is what he wants to do. If you can give it to him, you can get it back. Uh, but the problem we have is that he's trying to see where your heart is. That which is big, can you release it for me? Then I will surprise you. If he understand the concept of it, that one, that rich young ruler, assuming in that time and age, maybe it's like forty thousand dollars, and God want to multiply it to like ten million dollars, if only you release it and give. Don't you know what he said is that he that gives to the poor lend to the Lord. And he will definitely reward. So if he if he break the forty thousand and just distribute to all the poor, you know how much he's lending to the Lord. How much he will get a reward back? He missed the concept because he lacked understanding. So when we're talking about tithe, it's a, a, a pray that in all your getting, get understanding for yourself. Now people still keep saying, uh, mm, "What's the second thing you said?" You said, you said that uh, I forgot the. the is that, have I answered your question? Or? 
Okay. Yeah. There's an aspect of it, though, that I think I want to just hit on um, that he said. It, can you be black? Can you be a Christian and your finances be cursed? If you're a Christian and you don't adhere to certain principles, can your finances be cursed? And because the reason why I'm, I'm posing that question is because when I think about this is that if you're not blessed by God, there is no, and, I, and I'm, I'm asking this question to your thoughts on it, because there is no demilitarized zone, right? There is no neutral zone on earth. You're either blessed or you're cursed. Am I, am I stating that correctly? I mean, based on what we understand in scripture, there is no neutral zone where, okay, I'm not blessed, I'm not cursed. I'm right in the middle. No, you're either walking in the blessings of God or you're not. And when you're not, there are a host of other things that are associated with that. So when you look at this concept of um, if, you're, if you're not laying hold of the blessings that are in scripture, the only other option is that at this point, you're you're not if you're not blessed, you're cursed. Am I correct in saying that? If you think about it, I mean, if you really really think about the scripture, if you're not in Christ, you're in the world. If you're in the world, there are things that are associated with being in the world, and we can we can spend forever talking about that. But when I look at this idea of the fact that God says, "I will bless you in blessings, I will bless you," and there's so many promises that we have the opportunity to lay hold of. And if you're not laying hold of those promises, the only other option is that you are in this place where you haven't gotten the revelation that you need in God. And that as a result of not having that revelation, there are unintended consequences in that. Now you can call it whatever you want to call it. The fact of the matter is you're either being blessed by God or you're on this side. There's no neutral area. So when a Christian poses that question and saying that, okay, will I really help? Okay, I, I, I won't. Well, Jesus abolished the idea of the law. That's true. But the principles that we are to adopt as Christians are still relevant in today's age. The principles that he laid down, and it's so powerful because it goes back to the point that you made that. There are times where Jesus elevated the standard. And in, in, in everything, he elevated what we were supposed to do. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. Those, that's the Old Testament. Jesus said, no. When they strike you, turn your cheek. Pray for your enemies. Do these things. He, 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 he showed you. And then they said, what are the two greatest commandments? Jesus said, love the Lord to God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. And then the second is like it. Love your neighbor as your friend. So when you think about loving God, it still goes back to that heart thing. It's the heart. What does your heart, does your heart desire to obey God out of obligation or out of desire? What is your heart? It, Jesus always brought it down to the heart. Because even in it said that you can be circumcision is of the heart. It's no longer an outward manifestation. It's of the heart. Everything boils down to the heart. Where is your heart? And if you're trying to, the, see, the letter kills, but the spirit gives light. If you're trying to, trying to figure out, okay, how cursed will I really be? Will I be that cursed? Will I not? No, it's your heart. What is your heart? Where is your heart? What's the condition of your heart when you look at this concept of tithing, but also of sowing, seed time, and harvest time? of giving, of blessing, everything in scripture, everything that Jesus laid was counterintuitive to our human understanding. He said, give, and it will come back. He said, bless. He said, pray for. Everything was like the opposite of what we naturally want to do in our flesh. And so I just want us to always bring it back, this concept of tithing and sowing and harvest and giving. It boils down to your heart. What's your heart condition when you're understanding these principles? All right. Okay. I want to take us to Hebrews. And I want to just enlighten us on the first eight, seven, ten verses. This, if, and this is New Testament. If you want to connect it, you can go to Hebrew, uh, Genesis, 40, uh, Genesis 4, 14, 20. Let me hear that briefly. Genesis 14, Genesis 14 20. And blessed be God most high, who has delivered your enemies into your hand, and he gave him a type of all. Okay. Uh, 
If you start from verse uh, st 18, st yeah, it says, Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, bought bread and wine. He was the priest of God Most High. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abraham of God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And he gave him a tithe of all. All right. So, he, he, you know, what did, what did uh, she's desert get brought? Melchizedek bought bread and wine. Now, what is the concept of bread and wine? My body and my blood. Now, let me take you to uh, Hebrews 7. For this, now, she's Zedek, Melchizedek, king of Salem, prince of the most high God. He's a prince and king. And who are those that receive tribute? Kings. Who are those that receive tithe? Prince. A priest. He is both. This Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. To whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being translated king of righteousness, and then also king of Salem, meaning king of peace. And this one, verse 3, without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life. Who are we talking about now? That's Jesus. Your tithe belongs straight to Jesus. Who have not, without beginning of days nor end of life, but make like the Son of God. Remains a priest continually. His priesthood never have an end. That's what that is saying. Verse 4. Now consider how great this man was. To whom even the patriarch Abraham gave a tenth of the spoils. And indeed, those who are of the sons of Levi, who received the priesthood, they received priesthood, they now have elevated to be priests. They have a commandment to receive tithe from the people according to the law. That's the law. That is, from their brethren, the Levites can receive tithe from their brethren. The law, the law stipulates that. Though they have come from the loins of Abraham, all these ones that are collecting on behalf, are from, they came from the loins of Abraham. But he whose genealogy is not derived from them, Receive now. Who is this one that they are received without being in the same genealogy of the priesthood by law? But he whose genealogy is not derived from them received tithes from Abraham and blessed him who had the promise. He Abraham carries the promise, and when he received from him, he blessed Abraham. Now, this is going to be so. Speak right now. Now, now beyond all contradiction, beyond any, any shadow of doubt, the lesser is blessed by the better. So Abraham, the promised carrier, bowed to his highest authority and was blessed by the kids. He said, now beyond all contradiction, the lesser is blessed by the better. Here, mortal men receive tithe, that is the, uh, the, the delivered. Mortal men receive tithes, but there he receives them, of whom it is witness that he lives. The one that still continues to live. <laughs> now, see, even Levi, who received tithes, paid tithes through Abraham, so to speak. For he was still, Levi was still in the loins of his father when the Kilzedek met Abraham and Abraham paid tithe to him. Ultimately, when you pay your tithe, this is what you are rendering to Jesus. Now you say that pastor, they give it to pastor, but it is being, it, now don't, don't say, don't forget that there's corruption everywhere. And 
That does not exclude pastor. When we go to the priesthood now, we just want to open another kind of womb. And we've heard and seen and in print and in media every, everything about how you, that, that, that about pastors and reverends and fathers that have misused power and authority and embezzled and different things and commit rape. Now, if a doctor is bad, he commit medical error. And they forget some surgical blade in your stomach and you die. Does that destroy you from going to any doctor when you are sick next time? Just do your part. If mechanics rip you off today and then they, they, they rip you off and, and they didn't change the parts and, and that's it. If your car broke down next time, wouldn't you still drive it to the mechanic shop? So you say that pastors mess up and it's so bad it's unfortunate. But you do your part. And let the Lord be the judge. So he that receive, it when the money comes for tithe, it is used by human beings to improve different things to get the basic necessities. In the olden days, the tithe goes to the Levites, but no pastor should sit and don't want to consume the tithe. God will punish the devil. What's the question? Okay. Um, what you just said right now, sir, I think you just hit the nail on the head. And But here is the problem that people are saying, especially concerning that, and which is, like you said, if a doctor is bad, once that doctor is outed that this particular doctor is bad, one, the doctor will lose his license. He probably will not be able to practice. And uh, I definitely know I won't go to that same doctor. That is guaranteed because now the doctor is ousted and been bad. I think one of the one of the disservice that is being done to the body is not allowing accountability, total accountability in this area of tithing has been paid to the church. Now we can say that the tithe that is being paid to the church is being paid to God, which is what it is, but. The administration of the tithe is not done by God, it's done by people that are in the church. So at the end of the day, if the process becomes faulty, if people do no longer trust that process, then it brings to question, why do I want to continue to do something that the process has become faulty? Why do I still want to continue to do the same thing over and over again, knowing fully well that I'm going to get the same outcome? So now that we are getting to the cross of the matter, I want to ask, what is it that the church can actually do to maintain the integrity of all things when it comes to tithes? For instance, a lot of people have actually asked the question, how come the people that are paying tithe into a church or into, an, into, into, into the church, they, can, they, they cannot take care of themselves they cannot do a lot of things, but at the end of the day, the same church that they are paying tithes into is flying different private jets. When you see that, the question now becomes, ah, maybe I need to open my eyes and shine my eyes properly and try to do something else. So those are the questions that if we start to ask, attack those questions and we start to be real with ourselves and we start to say look this is wrong and this is right I think then the people will start to trust again in the whole process because right now a lot of people don't trust the process again praise the Lord I will say this you want to say something yes yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's, I mean it's it's I've had those arguments with people before where they're like well how come these pastors are flying and ride in Bentleys, private jets, and their congregations are suffering. How does that work in the kingdom of God? You're coming to church, you're paying your tithe, you can't pay your rent, but your pastor has a big house sitting on top of a, you know, in some, you know, type of uh, estate. I understand that question. And so to address that question on two fronts, one, so the system is broken in some aspects, right, system. So the first thing is that if you make it practical, people don't stop paying taxes because our system in America is broken, right? We have a broken tax system. That doesn't stop people from paying taxes. If you don't pay taxes, you are going to jail. You are going to get in trouble and you will go to jail. So if you if you adopt that in this kingdom on earth, Jesus said, pay unto Caesar's what is Caesar's, 
pay unto the Lord what is Lord. You pay your taxes, even though it's a broken tax system. The rich are not taxed as much as the poor. The rich, in comparison to what the rich bring in and the poor bring in, we have a broken tax system. That's what it is. It's been broken for generations. Everyone understands that. People have been trying to fix it in different aspects. So if you continue to pay taxes to a broken system, a man-made system, you cannot then say that because in a heavenly system, in a kingdom system where you may go to a church where your pastor rides around in this and, and you therefore feel like, well, I shouldn't have to pay tithe into that. It's, it's, it's really understanding the principle. It always goes back to that principle is that if you're going to practicalize it and say to yourself that, well, I don't want to do that, then you, you miss the heart of what God is trying to get to because God doesn't need you to concern yourself with how your pastor spends the money. What God needs you to concern yourself with is how your obedience to that. Now, within the church, there are checks and balances. You're right. We do need checks and balances in place. We, I mean, pastors shouldn't just have free reign to do whatever they want. You know, it's, there should be checks and balances within the church. And a lot of times you have boards, you have elders, you have deacons, you have co-pastors and things that are looking at it. One of the things that I really appreciate is that um, um, even within our ministry, I'll use our ministry as an example. What I love is that there's transparency. And, and, that, and that really gets to the heart of it is that when you understand, you know, you're, you're giving into this ministry and you understand that the resources are being used in this way to bless this, to uplift that, to do that, that, that transcends all of it. And so if you're part of a ministry where there isn't transparency and you're concerned with that, then, then you can, you know, serve, serve, let God use you, but don't. But don't use that as the measurement and say that, well, because I don't know what my pastor is doing with the money. I don't know where all my resources are going. Therefore, I'm not going to tap into the blessings of God. Then you're really setting yourself up to not fully embrace all that God has given you. He, you, you cannot focus on that because you will, you will, you, um, it's, it's, it's almost as if you're trying to say that if the environment is conducive, then I'll obey God. What? It doesn't work like that. You know what I'm saying? It, it, it cannot be, oh, I need a perfect environment to obey the promises of God. You're never going to have it. We, are, we live in a fallen world with fallen people that, and you pray and you believe and you pray. That's why the Bible says pray for your leaders. So you pray and you, and you believe that as I lay hold of this promise, I'm sowing into this ministry. Lord, I pray for my leaders that they will use the resources wisely, that they will use it for what they say they will use it and not concern yourself with how it's being done and the way it's being done and all of those different things. So that's that's the answer that I have for, for that. And I've heard that argument a lot of times. I think it's important as Christians that we don't get stuck there. You can sometimes get stuck and, and look at all this stuff that's happening and you say, well, forget it. I'm just not going to lay hold of that promise. No, it's for you personally. And you pray for your leaders and you believe that God will continue to lead them. That's a wonderful response to such a technical question. But then let me say this. When you get to a church and you are not clear the way the money is being spent. The Bible says, look unto Jesus, the author and the finisher. The one that you are paying that you assume is embezzling it and flying on your money. It's not going to reward you. God is the rewarder. And as you take the truth of the word and you apply it to your life and you follow the condition, the reward is coming to you regardless of have you worked with a very notorious and wicked supervisor that sits on your promotion and the Lord in a way miraculous way. Promotion comes not from the east, north, west, or south. God is the rewarder and he would reward what you have sown in secret. Now, another point is that if you are in a place and you suspect so, 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 and really they're embezzling the money, you have a choice. You answer, it was in your answer, the answer was in your question. You would definitely not go to that doctor, but you will not stop going to doctors. Then you leave the church. And when you leave the church, you leave on personal conviction that they are wasting the money, but you don't spread root a seed of discord and rail other people out that do not know exactly why they have to leave and they might end up not doing the work of God or getting to another job, it's coming down on you. He said it's better for the millstone to be retired on those one and drop into the bottom of the sea. 
And that's to be careful. When somebody has issue with the church, silently just exit yourself and don't spread because only God knows the bottom line. And that is very necessary to, to put it. So, uh, a system is broken, but it's a concept that you pursue. You don't look at what if eventually it looks like, almost like, and it's not. And then I get and that is why the Lord says that uh, do, vengeance is mine. Because how will you know the exact measure of what is done to you to give exactly? But if it's too much, you already have shortage in your head. The people say that, and thank you for the question. It's something that people say a lot of times. It is an Old Testament thing. It has been abolished under the law, and the pastor enriched themselves. There are churches. <laughs> he was talking about our ministry. Uh, if they land the cars that people drive, I think maybe, I don't know what number mine will be, like maybe it's thought to the last. But that's joy. Because if that is hard to do what God has put on your heart, it, that's transparency is what I will advocate anyway. But if it's not best shown, and let the people just face God, what if you are in a house of an unbelieving husband? Does it mean you're going to go to hell? What if your wife is not respecting you? Does it mean you should not love her because she's not respecting you? You have a duty as unto the Lord to do. What if your husband does not love you? Does it mean you should hold the respect because it's not love? No, no. Just do yours as unto the Lord. Let the man do his as unto the Lord. If the wife is not respecting you, the Bible says love, your love is not conditional on her respecting you, and your respect is not conditional on you loving her. Yeah. Even in the assumption, if you're making an assumption that your leader is mismanaging funds, that's a dangerous place to be in for two reasons. One, in the Bible, when you look at um, Moses, right, you had his siblings. Uh, Miriam and Aaron, they assumed that Moses was doing wrong because he married someone that wasn't an Israelite. They assumed that he did wrong in God's sight. And if you read that story, read that story very carefully because they had a leader and they assumed that he wasn't doing things correctly. And as a result of their assumption, they thought, they didn't even act, they thought things towards Moses. They thought. <laughs> And you see how God handled that situation. God mm -hmm. called them all together. And he explained to them. Like, he said, this is my servant Moses. I, I talked to him face to face. God validated Moses, Moses in front of them, often an assumption. Now, if you have a leader in your church and you're not sure, I would seriously pray that you, you check the heart, your heart, because it's important that you, one, pray for your leaders and don't, don't, don't believe evil unless you know it to be true. If, you, if it's plain and simple and you know it, but if you're assuming things, you don't know. You see, I remember um, someone preached a message before and was just like, you know, he was a preacher. He was like, you know, people see the way God has blessed me and the way God has blessed me and my family, but they don't know what I've been through. They don't know the struggle that I've been through. They don't know the journey that God could, took me through. And if you want to go through my journey to get through where I am, go ahead and go through my journey. So it's like, it's like you cannot compare um, yourself and say, well, you know, how come he can do all this and they get all that? You, you don't know everyone's journey and why they've gotten to where they are in life. So two points from that. Don't assume. Know the truth for what it is. Pray for your leaders. Check your heart and not assume bad things about them. And then two, everyone's on a different journey. You see, if, they're, if God is blessing them today and they're doing well, you have no idea where they were. You have no idea where God took them from to get them to where they are today. Can I just do something quick? Um, I'm so impressed with what you just said now because uh, I was listening on a YouTube about just an accusation. People assume that this big minister bought a jet and how much, how much did he pay for the jet was about 60 something billion dollars. People assume that he did, million. it was a million. But million. million, 60, uh, 65 million dollars. And it wasn't right, it was a gift that somebody gave to him. But already they've already assumed, they've already accused 
saying that it was the money of the church. So we need to be very careful. If we don't know the bottom of it, we can't just, just so we can leave everything to God and, like I said, to continue to pray for our leaders. Yes, that which is good, but uh, I am not going to sit here and say that every accusation against pastors are wrong. We are all human and subject to error. For some for the things that we've read and, and, and seen in the news, some these things do happen. Uh, the one that's supposed to be the upholder of the law just fell through. Uh, we see the rape cases and we see the, uh, So it happens. But the bottom line is that focus on God. Uh, and sometimes it might be wrongly assumed. And maybe it's true. Either way, if, I come, if I'm convinced that it's true, I choose to leave, just leave, seek God. Have we really taken time to pray for the leaders? You wouldn't know their struggle if you never make it a point to go lift them up in prayer. And when you see it, there will be some hard condition for you that might be different from accusation. It might show you as a weakness. It might show you as covering him here. It might show you as rebuke the spirit that is about. Now, now you do what the Lord say. But if you are convinced, then you want to be, be at peace to live quietly and, and let the church be without trouble. See? All right. Is there any other question? We don't need to go all the way and run two hours. Yeah, they would like to know if you have any. They would like to know if you have any examples of people that are tithed and seen results and God bless them. Because most people are saying that they tithe for years, they pay the little amount they have every week, every month, and still everything just becomes worse and worse. Nothing gets better for that. Okay. If you, if you, if you, now the questionnaire is not in the picture at all. So she, the, he or she was is saying things like people say they've tied, they've given their little for so many years and they never see anything in it. Have that person really tried? directly the, the questionnaire the question i want to know is that have you tried it really maybe for like just six months and tithe maybe you don't have but i'm saying that your seed will provoke harvest and uh what will you say i know that you say that people say but do, do you have any experience let, let is that person oh, yeah oh. so because when you say that people say give me an example of i am an example for example, I am an example of one that tied and that have seen the, the yield of tight. He is my son. None of my children goes to church without the one that makes ten dollars the tight, they will put it there. For forty dollars the tight, they will put it there. He is my son, he tied. A lot of our ministers here they tied. Now, when you do it not grudgingly. When I sit in church any day and I happen not I happen not to have money, I left my wallet and my, my checkbook at home and, and I can't I end up not putting something there, I feel kind of I feel pain. But when I have this little check in my hand, I put it there, I I, I feel joy. And then uh, I mean, I've seen I've seen the reward personally. And I know beyond any doubt he has seen the reward. Personally, when, okay, let me tell you about him. There was a time that uh, he, he, he had this conference that he needed to attend overseas, out of the state. And then uh, it was a very uh, unique opportunity that he had, and they had to fund themselves 
clothes, they need to buy the ticket, they need to stay there for a month and do everything. And then he called me, and I, I knew he was planning to travel out for a month, and I know that he was working in a place that he cannot take that time out. And one day I called him and I said, you know, you, you need to, are you going to resign? He said, say, we'll see. And then they called him just before it was like, three weeks to his time to go. And they called him and they said, you know, he was working at the Christian University and they said that the, the, uh, the numbers we are trying to reach, we, we were unable to reach it. So now we're trying to do some things. We're trying to lay people off. And they've been laying people off. People have been losing their jobs. And when they called him to, to meet with the HR, he was there with his supervisor and the other higher one, and they said that, yeah, uh, it has come to the place, we're going to let you go. But because of your exemplary behavior, performance here, we have decided to do something different. We're going to pay you two months' salary straight. And uh, you can leave tomorrow and never come back. That's fine. You, you don't need to serve for the two months. But we're going to give you two months' salary. And... Uh, as a student, he was a work, he was a staff as, a, as well as a student. He was doing his doctoral program. And they said that, well, for the remaining maybe one and a half years, three years that you have to finish, we will still keep your tuition free until you bag your doctoral degree. So, they, so he went for one month and he was still being paid. And he came back and for another one month. He still received salary. Now, how that doesn't happen. This is America, man. It doesn't happen like that. <laughs> See? So that that if that is not enough to and in several other areas, we have seen it. Left, right, and center. I know that it works because I'm a living witness. Yeah, I love that question because it's very practical. It's a very practical question. I think sometimes, you know, we we, we talk about these concepts and these principles, but to practicalize it, it's a very good question because I'm, I think I've asked myself that same question. We've all had, at some point you ask yourself, Lord, I'm tithing. How come all these other people aren't tithing? We're, we're on equal footing, it looks like. You know, we, we make money, we pay bills, we're doing this. And, and, and I, remember, I remember one of the times I asked God, the Lord just, I was driving home one day, just frustrated because the numbers weren't working out, trying to pay for this, trying to do that. And the Lord just reminded me of like, you know, the fact that I, I it, it was it was the wrong way of looking at it. You know what I'm saying? You're thinking this input yields that output. And that's not how it works in God's kingdom. You know, God doesn't work on our numbers. It's not, it's not one plus one equals two. I mean, if it was like that, we would always be in a deficit with God. It's like you have no idea how many times God has prevented things and shielded it. And the blessings that 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 cover you, you're assuming you're you're limiting the blessing of this to just finances. I mean, so many different areas that God has blessed me. I had no reason being blessed in it. But because he reminded me that the faithfulness of this yields reward in so many different areas. It's not limited to finances. So please don't limit it to just finances and say, well, because I tithe and these people don't tithe, it looks like we're on. You have no idea. If God could open, it's like, it's like that servant of the, of the prophet whose eyes needed to be opened to see that they were more with them than were against them. If God could open up your eyes to see the things that he's doing, the things that he's setting you up for, the things that he's shielding you from, you would, you would be so humble. You would say, thank you, God. You wouldn't even have to ask that question because you're obeying his principle, you're believing in him, and he's blessing you in ways that you may not even know until the other side of eternity when he shows you, you have a full revelation of what happened on earth. Okay, wow. You know, so believe in it and trust it that he's doing what he said he would do. And, and uh, excuse me, significance really is not necessarily in the amount of what you're able to acquire. Significance, or apart from money, significance, the definition and the meaning of significance is the number of people you are able to reach and touch. So if you are basing your reward from tithe to be money back into, yeah, money is part of it. 
but much more than money. It is, yes. Can you explain in details the difference between tithe and offering? And also, can you give tithe in kind? I don't want to pay money to the path, to the church in case they spend it. <laughs> Why don't I go and give the homeless babies some clothes, some food? Can that be tithe? Okay, now this, let, let me go back to the he brought the concept of tax. And uh, your tax is certain percentage, and the government don't even give you the, you the, the option for you to get your money and pay your tax. Mm -hmm. The government takes it right away. But if you refuse to pay your tax, and you rather want to fix your driveway, or you want to go and sink a borehole in the public place for the homeless to drink water, and you don't pay your, instead of your tax, you will suffer consequences for it. So, 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 no, you cannot give your tax in kind because you are, you drive the church van to pick people that substitute to your tithe. That is wrong. You can do that. It's simple. It said, it says, when do you pay your tithe? Tithe. The very first thing you spend, you take it out. Some churches, like we do here, we have a cash app because when you get paid on Monday and you buy your okra, you buy your pepper, you buy your, you know, celery and salad and you, you, you and all of that stuff. By the time it's, uh, you pay your car note and you buy your gas in the car, by the time you're coming on Sunday, you're already, you have more days than money now. So the moment you get it, take it out. Because it's not, it's not yours. You know what? When I have to, pay, to spend some money, at the end of the day, the tithe sits at the end of everything. It sits there. That is it. So, no, you can't really substitute and give to homeless instead of... To, what you give to homeless will be... You can give gifts. You can give in terms of... The difference between tithe and offering is that offering does not have a percentage attached to it. It's a free will offering. What Noah did was offering he, from his heart. And when you put your tithe, you put up, if you like, the next Sunday you put offering, it might be $10, it might be $20. It's from no compulsion and there is no cap on that. You just do that. That's different. Uh, and then, what is the other question? To give a specific details? It, it, it said, the, the, if the details is that I would say, when Abraham, and the very first time it was mentioned, he gave a tenth of everything. The animals, maybe it's a hundred, he gave ten. And the goats, maybe it's two hundred, he gave twenty. And this, so he gave ten, ten, ten of everything he got from the spoil of the battle, and he gave it to Melchizedek. That is how tithe is registered. And let me know before. That is how tithe is registered. It's not... If you give 8%, please call it offering. Don't call it tithe. Because your tithe is 10%. It's the tenth. What was it? Yeah, and, and it's, you know, I, want this, I want you guys to understand something. It's not legalism, right? We're not into this thing of legalistic way of looking at this. It goes back to your heart. And I, and I really want, you know, when it comes to this, pray, really pray, really let the Holy Spirit lead you. Let the Holy Spirit cultivate this, this deep, you know, it's, it's a deep concept because we live in a culture where it's like the more, more, give me more, give me more, give me more, give me more. Giving is not necessarily the way, you know, things are. It, when you're a giver, you're, you're not the norm in, this, in, in, in life, right? When you're a giver and you constantly bless others, it's not normal. So I, I want people to understand that it's a heart thing. Let it get into your heart and let the Holy Spirit lead you in your understanding of this. Because it, it's like, it's like when, you, when you get to a point and you're trying to, like for instance, do you tie the gross or do you tie the net, Right? That's been a that's been a debate. You know, do I do I wait for Uncle Sam to get his Medicaid and all these different things to come out and then I tithe on that amount? 
or do I tithe on the full amount that I would have had if all these things hadn't come out? That's been a thing. And for me, this is me personally, I've prayed about this and I really feel led to tithe on the gross, the gross amount that I get. But the Bible doesn't say specifically about gross and net. The Bible does say everything you receive. So that to me, that means everything. The Holy Spirit has given me that understanding of everything. Then I tithe on that and then everything else comes out. But the reason why I'm bringing that example up is because we can make it so legalistic as Christians. And it's not meant to be that. It's meant to understand the principle of, of the fact that God has given you something. He's blessed you with something. And he wants to see where your heart is. Yep. Are you depending on all these other yep. things that if I take care of this, that'll provide for me. If I take care of that, that'll provide. Do you understand where your true provider is? And in understanding who your true source is, he, he wants you to give that back as a way to show that because where your heart is, where your treasure, that's where your heart is. And if you take part of your treasure and you sow it back and you say, Lord, I give this back to you, that shows him where your heart is. It's always a heart check. It always boils down to that. So don't make it so legalistic and say, okay, well, if I do this and do that and maybe take away, you're missing the heart of why the Lord created this. I said that for the ever revelation produces to the level of our understanding. And I use the passage, which is Matthew 13, verse 23, and where the, the, the source just cut a sea and it fell on four different kinds of soil among the thorns, on the rocky side, on the west side, and none of these three seas prosper in any way, shape, or form. And some fell on good ground, and it defined the good grounds as those that took the word willingly, and they understand what it says. And then they were able to be fruitful, and they brought forth fruits from the word. But this, these are Christians that received the word and they took it in and they allowed it to grow and it brought out fruits. And then it brought different level of fruits. Some 30, some 60, some 100. Now how come that if these are all good ground and these are believers that took the word and they take it in and they, they dwell on it and it produced fruit, how come they have various crop yield? Because the level of understanding determines the output they come from, that come from it. So some people might be so legalistic and say that it has to be from the from, from, from the next. It's not from the gross. Some people will say that I could do it in kind. It's, you, you, you see, it, God is a God of order. If you follow the principle, and I'm I'm not I'm don't I'm not sure why some people have been tithing for years and there's no reward. Come on now. Check yourself. I'm not saying that uh, you're a sinner, you're this and that. No, 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 no. Do you allow, say, for all that have been led by the Spirit, the same are the children of God. What is in some life area that is hindering or that, that is so, uh, just leaking resources? Now, if you are paying your tithe and you like to gamble and you pay a lot of money gambling, I don't know how that, can, that person can be rich. If there's a habit that continues to drain resources, I don't. God is not going to twist you and you will never, he won't tie your hand down so that you won't do what you want to do. I don't know if you pay your tithe and you are alcoholic, money is going to be draining. What is, so, so, and if you are doing it grudgingly, you are not true, you, now if I get it, I won't be able to pay my rent, and maybe if I do this now, I won't be able to have this, and I have to pay my school fees. No, okay, you have so much to do, don't do it then, go do what? Because either way, well, if you don't pay your tithe, you, must, you will still be shot at the end of the month. Just even as, as if you pay your tithe, you might still be shot. I'm not saying that you won't be shot at the end of the month, but... You may not be short eventually, and again, maybe you won't be short. But if you will do it first, it is not a magical thing. Do it, let it become a star, and start to see God move in His way, because it is not a man to lie, and it's not yeah. a son of man to repay. And I have a practical example. So a few years ago, um, someone called me, someone I was working with. Um, it was a, a woman I had helped her and her son before. Um, they were, they had just come into the country. Um, they needed help. She called me and said, look, I need help. If I don't get this amount of money, I'm going to get kicked out of my house. 
And I said to myself, Lord, you know, you see everything's allocated for. Tithe goes here. This goes that. Those goes that. There goes that. And I prayed about it. I'm like, Lord, you know, what do you say? What, what, what do I do in this type of situation? She needed a certain amount. And a certain amount, it, it wasn't going to be able to work. And so it was interesting. I was like, I was like Lord, I can't. And I, and I felt, and I, what I felt led to do in that moment is give the tithe that I had at, or uh, already allocated to the church, I gave to her. And I said, but God, like, that's wrong. I shouldn't do that. That's, that's not right. You shouldn't. I can't do that. But I really felt led to do that. And it was interesting because I said to myself, and the Lord showed me, he was like, just the next time you get the resources, you get paid, just pay it back, double it back up. I mean, don't, don't make it so, like, unpractical. Like, this, you can just give and then just get. I mean, I was just, I was stuck in this legalistic way that every single time I need to make sure. Let the Holy Spirit lead you, and he'll give you deeper understanding about the ways of God. You know what I'm saying? Pray about opportunities that open up that God some things may happen and it may not go exactly according to plan, but let the Holy Spirit lead you. And God sees your heart. If your heart is really to please him and you want to please him, he'll open up ways to be able to do that. In another example, someone else called me and needed money and I did not have it. And because I made my heart, I said, Lord, I, I want to be able to bless this person, but I don't have it. The Lord opened up another door that I didn't even expect. Money came in and I was able to bless them. I still gave my tithe. My tithe was already gone. I gave that. A door was open. So let the Holy Spirit lead you in these things and really and really allow the 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 the, the depth of what this concept, what this principle is. Wow. Well, see, only that, that's wonderful. <laughs> what so <laughs> uh well seriously I I thank God that I was never in a situation where I will uh, but the Lord, the Lord's faithful. He said, "Well, the next one you do double, and then you did double, and you are still able to meet your other's financial responsibility." Okay, so God is greater than man. Okay, uh, don't take this. Don't go pay your school fees with your time and say that uh, next time. Do see it's it's a uh, uh, I'm still struggling with that. that. That's a whole area of debate. But uh, he, he just you know, I just heard him say that. Okay, all right. Can, can we briefly talk about false fruits? I don't. Want, we can't talk about false fruits because uh, we won't have time to deal with it. That the, what, the funny thing I said from the beginning is that it's so such a vast topic. Tithe, offering, false fruit. Even we have not exhaustively deal with tithe, so we won't deal with fast food. We're going to open something we cannot wrap up. Yes, is there any question on the tithe? Yes. This is actually not a question. It's just me actually, or, uh, just on my own part, just saying something concerning giving tithes. And um, I shared this before, and I just want to share it because it's relevant now. Uh, it was back in Nigeria uh, before coming down uh, to the States. Uh, I was in a meeting, you know, in a, in a fellowship, and the pastor said, give an offering that you've never given before. <clears throat> this was like 15, 16 years ago. And when he was saying that, in my mind, I was just saying, ah, there's this particular amount of money that I've already put aside to do something with and immediately said that something just said you have to give that money ah I started to bind <laughs> ah, every spirit that wants to collect this money from me I said I knew it when I was coming to this meeting that something was going to happen yeah. anyway long and short of it I did not even give the money that day because it was a struggle I, I started to debate I started to calculate I said how about okay just to, be, just to, to tell you the amount, it was a couple of years ago, 25,000 naira, this was the amount, and it was a lot of money then for me. I said, okay, how about I just give, we split it 50-50, I give 15, I take the transaction. I, I, try, just, I did everything, and it just didn't go down well. And eventually, I said, okay, you know what, I'll give it. I didn't give it that day. When I go back home, I was still debating it. After a while, I could not just shake it. I took I just took the money, put it in an envelope, 
and I went to church the next day, and I gave it to, you know, there was no service, so I had to give it to one of the usher, that look, I promise God, this, just go and help me put it there. And the long and short of that was, the, that same week was the week we were going to the American Embassy to get visa. And we got to the embassy now. We all went with virgin passport. Every one of us. Okay, maybe my cousin actually had some visas on theirs, but like four of us went with virgin passport. And edge, well, we, when we came back, everybody was already assuming that they were not going to give us visa, and everybody came back with two years multiple visa. Why did I bring that up? Sometimes we don't know how God is going to do what he says he's going to do. When we obey, it's, sometimes it's not, it's not easy because your flesh is always going to wrestle with you and it's going to tell you there is no... But when you obey, the reward far, 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 far outweighs everything that you can imagine or think about. Praise God. You see, the beginning of tithing is very, very difficult. Because you are parting with something you think you can use in three, four, five different places. And that without faith, no one can please God. And when you, you take the truth of the word, apply, to, apply it to your life, and follow the condition and start to see. Now, if you would go to God before you even put out your tithe, that will be, it will make it a little bit easy for you. You just give it, and the next time you give, and the fourth time, by the fifth time, you, how, what is, how does the habit form? When you start, and then you start to repeat, and you start to repeat, it becomes part of you. How do you start a bad habit? Cocaine, you took the first, whatever it is, and then you feel your jacket, and they go back the next time, and then, then you can get out of it. And then, then if you, you have to fight again to get yourself out by cultivating a counter habit to get out of it. Now, this is the same with tithing. If you trust God and you do it by faith, everything that we get into in the Christian, Christian doctrine is by faith. And if you do it by faith, trusting God, and uh, start to see him come through in his work, you see, I just, it just occurred to me that this topic that we're treating today is in response to requests from our online uh, listeners. I, 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 I don't want to treat it, but uh, it carries like the second largest, apart from one that we treated before. I said, okay, so we're going to do it. But uh, it's not something I want to, once I say it, it just come in and out, during my message, just come like one time, two times. And uh, one day I committed to teaching it because I want everybody to capture, to catch a concept here and then see it as not enriching the church and, and if they fly jet with your money you are not the accountant that, that audited the, the paper to know that this is how the money came uh, I know that a couple of big uh, ministry they've been invited by this the the the, 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 is it the, house, the house of rep and the IRS invited them and even the lawmakers invited them and with the big names like Benny Benny Hinn and all those big names but the, and they never indict them because they realized that there was nothing there to, 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 to nail them so I will focus on God I know everything that the word say is true and I believe it taking nothing out of it and I believe if I do like he like the like the prescription in the world result was come yeah. yeah and I think ultimately it just boils down to um, you know I remember as a kid one of the first scriptures I ever memorized we were in church I was like eight years old and we were doing a play around Christmas time it was a play that talked about we had all the kids line up, and one of the scriptures that I had to memorize was um, store up your treasures, not on earth, where thieves can break in and steal, where wrath and moth can, can rust, and thieves can break in and steal. Store up your treasures in heaven, where wrath and moth will not destroy, and thieves cannot break in and steal. And that's such a powerful scripture, um, because God wants you 
to be reckless when it comes to being a giver. He just, he gave it all. I mean, he gave his son, he gave it all. You know, how, why do we hold back in anything, whether it's money, whether it's time, whether it's resources, it always boils down to what are you willing to sacrifice? What are you willing to give? And that's why Jesus said, count the cost. If you're not willing to give it all, if he told you today to give everything you had in your account, would you be willing to do it? it, that, it I mean, that's, when, G, when you look at God, there have been times where we all have stories. I know, I know my dad has stories where God, it, it's like you get that check to give an amount that in your right mind you wouldn't give. You would not give this in your right mind, but you know the Holy Spirit is leading you. I have tons of stories when that happens. And it's, like, and it's like God is constantly wanting to see where's your heart, where's your heart at, where's your heart at, and revealing to you what's in your heart because he knows what's in your heart. And so this concept of tithing, it's deep, but the it's so much deeper because it really boils down to the scripture he read, seed time and harvest time, where we live in a time where um, since, as long as the earth remains, seed time and harvest will not cease. But what, what's powerful about what Jesus showed us is that, you know, he came and gave it all. And we in our lives are as a result, we now have access to God. And we are to give it all in whatever way that looks like. If the standard that God is calling you to is to tithe, tithe. And then he'll call you to a higher standard. You will not be at that same standard. I'm not at the standard of tithing anymore. That is something that God has already taught me. I've, I've surpassed that. Now it's, it's, great. it's more it's how much is he calling me to give in different situations. So let God work on your heart and show you that there's so much reward in saying, Lord, take it all. Have it all. I give it all to you. Whatever you tell me to do, I will do it. And you will see things that he will do in your life that you never imagined. Let's live a life of giving. And let it be from the heart. The Pharisees gave so that people can see them give. I just gave 2,000 and you fly. He said, let not your le her right hand know what your left is doing. But tithe, he knows how much he gives you. Now you are saying to God, this $40, I'm saying that you have allowed me to earn $400. Now it's left for the master to now look and say, ah, I think I want to give you more than 400 Since that's Thing. So the question for the lady, no, not the question for the lady, I'm just going to, I'm just going to turn back to the, what the lady said. I'm not sure whether she's a lady or a man, really. But I said that uh, some, those that have been given time and they never make it, are there some that have not been given that never make it to? Or even if they never give and they make it, the Bible says, how does the the unrighteous prosper. It's for a short while. So don't look at who is making it and not making it monetarily. Look at hearts to follow obediently what the Lord states in his word and then allow the Lord that is the promiser to make good his promise. By obediently doing what the word says, you are bringing God down in terms to make the, the, the binding with, the, with his word. That becomes a covenant. And nobody breaks covenant. So that is what uh, we say. And with this, we're going to be landing this, this, the, the plane of this uh, program here. Uh, we want to thank everyone that's, that listened, that uh, contributed in questions and comments. And those on, online, that even the listening audience, and I know that people will still continue to visit the site and still replay the the, the, the the program. But I pray that the Lord, you see, it's, it's by revelation and understanding. And that which you capture, no man can take it from you. It becomes yours and your children, children. And that is what it is. So Father, we give you glory this time. For grace, we pray that you will give us the utterance and give us the word and so that both the speaker and the hearer will benefit. And I pray, I thank you, that that you've done. Uh, even in areas where we don't seem to come into agreement, 
Help us to be able to take it to the Lord individually and let the Spirit of the Lord bring clarity. And so we thank you, God, in Jesus' name. And all the children of God say, Amen. Thank you. God bless you.